Uh, kia ora all, I'm Izzy. I'm the creative producer here at Touch Compass. My pronouns are they, them. Real quick audio description. i am uh, got dark curly hair, white framed uh, reading glasses and a black t-shirt uh, on a white background with the Touch Compass logo up in the corner. So we're going to, as usual, begin with uh, the three of our artistic direction panel discussing today's topic which is the five pillars of disability consciousness. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Rodney. Tēnā tātou katoa, ko tāi nui te waka, ko Nāti Manyapoto te iwi, ko Nāti Rora te hapu, ko Rodney Bell taku ingoa. A sincere greetings to all today. Um, I descend from the tāi nui waka, and my primary tribe is Nāti Manyapoto, my son sub is Nati Rora. My name's Rodney Bell. So hey, thank you for your time. I'm sitting in my little abide, my little hapare in Tikuiti Tanga. Uh, I'm sitting in my manual chair. I've got a uh, light colored vest on and I've got a shirt under that that's striped. So both of them are striped. Um, I'm, I'm feeling excited in this moment. What drives me is uh, the sacrifice my ancestors in the earth uh, has gone through for me to be here with you today. And once again, thank you so much. I'd like to introduce you to Lucy. Malo Lada, I am Lucy Fega. I am a light brown skin with my black hair tied up in a ponytail. I am sitting in my power chair in my lounge living room. I am wearing a colorful pinky top. I am a performer and been with Touch Compass for years. I take it to Suzanne. Thank you, Lucy. Kia ora. Uh, my name is Suzanne Cowan. I'm sitting here today on my couch in my living room in Greylin. I'm pale skinned. Um, I have dark brown hair that's pulled back into a ponytail. I'm of um, English, English, Irish, and Scottish descent. Um, and I'm sitting on a green couch. <laughs> okay, I'll pass it over back to you, Rodney. Yeah. I'll turn up here, Suzanne. <laughs> so yeah, hey, we're gonna be talking about the five pillars of disability consciousness uh, that we're working with currently with Touch Compass Dance Trust. And we can look at them as pillars or principles that we're sort of like that's leading the way for us or sort of really defining the path for us. And I'm going to talk about two of those with you today. And the first one be, being disability leadership. So nothing about us, but led by us. So, uh, well, the sort of underpinning uh, mana for disability leadership, uh, when I say that to you for me and for us as an ADP is that we're in the center of all decision making. We're sort of, uh, we're, we're really involved right across the board with Touch Compass Dance Trust in that disability space. And, and uh, I must admit, like I come there with my lived experience of disability and therefore there's, uh, there's no way that I can talk in a general sense, but in particular to the arts and my experience that I've had, I've, I've got some really strong foundation when it comes to, um, supporting and, and, and uplifting our kaupapa around disability leadership. I'm very excited about this space and hey, I, I will admit that it's a, a lot of new corners for me or a lot of new uh, ways of thinking for me, but also I think because there's been a lack of uh, disability leadership in, in organizations that I've been with. So being at the forefront takes a little bit of a tethering process. There. And uh, what comes with that is that consciousness around not only disability consciousness, but that collective consciousness. So we're all working together and uh, finding uh, out like new ways of sort of communicating and, and realizing, hey, what, what's, you know, what is disability consciousness? What do we need to teach each other? How can we grow from it? And also um, doing a bit of research around what, what it is for our our arts community, our disabled arts community. Now, uh, another pillar, another principle I'd like to talk about is a little bit experience. So as an, AD, as an artistic direction panel, uh, we looked at lived experience as mana enhancing and we honor the authenticity of lived experience, especially for the chronically ill, sick, 
cripple, crip, we say, <laughs> we're owning that word. Uh, this is the foundation of our kaupapa and the basis of our, uh, our toy, our art. Um, it is reflected in all our decision-making and actively works to rebalance the history of benevolence that has been associated with disability um, around art making and art making spaces. <clears throat> so obviously we come, you know, we're, we're honoring our lived experience, not only as an artist, but also um, having like for myself an acquired disability and what that means for me, not only to, uh, to live day to day, but also just the different like, like I don't really like to use this word, but I've, I've heard about the, un, the uncomfortable sort of uh, uh, reacting to the uncomfortable sort of society that's around us when it comes to access, when it comes to just like um, pushing down the road, you know, we've got pavements, you know, it's just our everyday sort of task and, and, and sort of uh, sitting in that positive space to sort of conquer and, and overcome these, all these um, uncomfortable situations. And, and yeah, and, and what comes with that though, I, I feel with this lived experience is, is you, um, you set tools up for yourself, not only psych psychologically, but physically as well. And then they just become part of you. So therefore, once you manage uh, these, um, you know, things around access for, for yourself or for myself, I should say, as a disabled, person, um, you, you can sort of push them aside and focus on just your, like um, your career, for instance, being here, dancing and so forth. So yeah, and that, and that takes time. And I think that needs honoring as well. Uh, oh, Rodney, of... could we have an interpreter slot, please? Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, off you go. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so lived experience and that's what's great about our, our panel is we come from such a, a different uh, backgrounds and yeah, and, and that's what enhances us as a panel, driven from three totally mana enhanced uh, disabled uh, artists. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And, and another thing about that too is that we have, um, what I love about this panel is because we, uh, under, what underpins it is friendship, but also we're treating it professionally as well. And, and in that professional space, we're sort of making some really strong decisions and but we are able to like negotiate the things that we disagree with as well. So I'm excited about that. So Noreda, tēnā tātou katoa. Suzanne. Thanks Rodney. Um, yeah, I just wanted to build on what Rodney's um, speaking about, and I feel like as a disability community, we're at this really pivotal moment in time uh, where we're actually developing a really strong voice, and the platform that we're moving from is from the arts, and I feel that um, that's a really powerful place because we're sort of involved in a dreaming in a way or kind of like a reimagining of how... Uh, how the world can be and I think that's a very exciting place to be so that's why we develop these five pillars of disability consciousness because sometimes when we speak about disability consciousness people think oh well what do you mean by that you know is it about access um, is it about having a platform what is it so we came up with these five pillars um, and this is a lot to do with um the moment in time we're in about shifting particularly this organization from being an integrated dance company um, which was how it was founded um, into a disability led company and that's a huge shift um, and as Rodney said it's a really exciting space to be in so just to um, build on uh, the pillars that Rodney mentioned uh, the leadership and the lived experience I wanted to talk a little bit about disability aesthetics. So our art is driven by a disability aesthetic, recognizing that we have our own crip culture, which intersects many cultural identities. The disability aesthetic reflects the extraordinary qualities of people with disabilities. It also values the multiplicity of lived experience. So, um, 
yeah, disability aesthetics. That can be quite a hard thing for you to get your head around in terms of, well, what do we mean by an aesthetic? An aesthetic is often in a, like a quality. Um, and I think for disability art, uh, through the authenticity of our lived experience, uh, we develop particular qualities through our art. And that might be something quite tangible, for example, like the techniques we develop um, in particularly in performance art. For example, Rodney has particular ways of using his chair. Lucy has particular ways of using her power chair. And I've also developed my own techniques of, of being in my chair and outside my chair. Someone hasn't got their microphone off. <laughs> Is that you, Rodney? No, no, it's not me. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah. So an aesthetic is, is something that is very specific to disability artists, and it's quite an exciting sort of avant-garde place to be uh, because we're developing new ways of developing our art and, and new techniques and new qualities and bringing that to the performance realm. Oh, Rodney's just shared that in the uh, in the chat as well, just for a little bit of extra detail. Yeah. Okay, and the other pillar I wanted to talk about um, was we're also adopting the affirmative model of disability. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the social model of disability which identifies the disabling barriers, barriers in society. And so from the social model of disability, we're saying that actually disability isn't located in the individual, it's actually located in society. And so society actually sets up a whole lot of barriers and also through a lot of different institutions that make it difficult for us to access. Whereas the affirmative model of disability really builds on that. Um, and I think it, it develops the philosophy in the sense that we're going back to the experience of our bodies um, and the experience of having uh, a physical difference, a sensory difference, a neurological difference. And we're saying that we value that as a unique positive experience. And then if I compare that with the medical model, um, that's very different because if you think about the medical model, the def it's more concentrated on the idea of developing a deficit model of disability. So we're shifting that and we're shifting the model of disability into a positive valued experience. Um, I could say a little bit more about that. If you just bear with me for a moment. So the affirmative model demands a recognition of impairment as an ordinary rather than an extraordinary characteristic of human experience and for inclusion with an ordinary life on that basis. Impairment is framed as a positive valued experience. There's less em emphasis on impairment classification. There's no mention of people needing to be fixed and obstacles needing to be removed. It identifies disability as a productive relationship. It encompasses positive social identities, both and collective, for disabled people grounded in the benefits of lifestyle and life experience of being impaired and disabled. And the affirmative model of disability is in direct opposition to the dominant personal tragedy model of disability and impairment. It builds on the liberating aspects of the social model. So that's just to outline the affirmative model of disability. And then I'm gonna pass over to Lucy, who's gonna talk about equity as the fifth pillar of disability consciousness. <laughs> Mallow Lager, equity is about making sure that we, the artists, get the access to the same opportunities. And also fairness is important too, 
Accessibility for the arts sector is going to be a great opportunity for the engaging new generation of artists to allow them to create work where they can do it all year round. So this is the main aspect of having the right support in application of funding, picking the right management and production team to get where it would be hard work for them to go through the process and it costs them a quite lot to actually get started. I believe it will be a good learning process for the people that non-disabled really understand how it is important for us all the artists. So it's important for Touch Compass moving forward with a real asset for our equity and the access to other opportunities and support our disabled artists in the future. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, and I think now, um, having sort of outlined those five different pillars, I think we're going to open it up to questions. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, we haven't had any questions in the chat just yet. Um, so we'll just open it up to anyone who'd like to ask. Yeah, well, I guess what I you say disability artists, what does that mean to be aware? How do you support upcoming people with disabilities and what does it mean? Thank you, Trish, for asking that question. I think, um, what is this, what, uh, are, you, uh, are you asking what is a disabled artist? Yes. what? And I sort of got an understanding you're talking about different levels that, yeah. that uh, disabled artists are at. Yeah, and I, that's, a, that's a really good question because that's something that we're really trying to define what that means for Touch Compass Dance Trust. You know, like working with artists at all levels, I think is, is our primary goal. But what, what does that mean? Do we, because um, obviously we want to put out some really strong, um, performances and so forth and enhanced with some really strong choreographers but then uh, then there's this word that comes in for me that I'm that I'm always questioning around high-end art and what that means you know and what does a high-end art mean is, is it something that's really like um, a, a spectacle the people like flying around everywhere and and you know and that sort of what 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 um the, what audiences want to see with, with uh, artists that have disabilities, you know, disabled dance companies. And we then, are, we see that it could be I was moved by the way she we I could to some of her story in the same way because I also live in the institution for most of my life. So I know what it's not bad, but I'm a movie dancer. We are done and that's for my head. Mm. Yes. Yeah, kia ora, Trish. And that's very important. I think people that want to, uh, any, anybody that wants to be an artist needs to be enhanced. Like for, you know, like for myself as well, you know, like I had to learn, you know, and, and it took lots of different steps. It took lots of different support. So yeah, we definitely want to toe talk or any disabled person that wants to be a, a performing artist in whatever that might look like. Well, then, uh, uh, I have learned a lot from Samara, I still have learned a lot from Samara. Yeah, kia ora. Suzanne, do you have anything to add or Lucy? No, I think you covered it really well. Thanks. Can we just do an interpreter swap, please? You sure can. Thank you, Rodney. Is there anyone else that has a question? Yeah. Or a comment. 
Okay. I I think the um the notion of high end art. So what I what I've got here, uh, holding up, is a photograph with two pieces of work made in 1994 by um, a woman, Judith Scott. And Judith Scott was um, prodigious in her art making um, in a studio, including and focused mainly on people with learning disability, with intellectual disability in Los Angeles. So the material composition which she produces might in the art world be rejected as being incomplete and odd and misshapen and not having much value but looking at her art making and her role and identity as an art maker is what really pushed the boundary and, and the limits. And I held that up because I think there's a sort of a metaphor there for the, the, uh, the product that is produced and the viewer's response. And there's something between the performance and viewing the performance that is this aesthetic and that, that, that generates a reaction. And Susan, you, you spoke about it um, three Zoom sessions ago, about how you were more intrigued by the dance making of those disabled people than the able participants with them. And it was doing something in your frame of register and measurement of what was aesthetically valuing and challenging to you as the audience member. And I think somehow in all of this, there's the space, there's the, 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 the area that people come into. And Rodney, yeah, there is this sort of distinction and difference about being able to be open for all, but then raising the question of, of those kind of levels. And I wonder if that's still a, a work in progress, as it were, because it's the performance or the viewing um, or the working and going into someone's studio and seeing what is there which achieves that. Yes. Um, so it's about doing as much as the conceptual framing of how to, it's the, it's the, the when to and with whom um, mm. and, and that real thing. Also, I think it's a big collective. It's not yeah. about individuals and, and JT and I yeah. talked about that the other day. If this is about movement forward, it's about not I being me being best, Yes, about something about collectively this shaking and this upending um, of the limitations that emerge when we use language in negative ways. Um, yeah. and the, the language of, of labeling and othering and disrespecting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I suppose really a, a, a very deep historical fear of contagion of disease and affliction and not wanting to be like those other people. Oh, you know, the ones now these days we use the word disabled, but in the past we've used other language to make that distinction clear. And where I live, if I was to get in my motor car and five minutes drive towards the city, I would pass the Avondale Lunatic Asylum. It's still there in all its manifestation and glory. It's been there since 1881. And, and there's, you know, the enormous reminder of those ways of dealing with, well, people who don't fit as, you know, <laughs> well, it still is, you know, um, as you've got your own place to go to, go away, piss off, you're not one of us. And I don't know if you can see this. I, I, I also looked, no, you can't, I'll hold it up. I'm really good at this, aren't I? Rodney's visuals. It's a little badge that came from, um, a summer institute in Montreal that we went to. Um, and piss on pity is what it says. Pretty blunt, mm -hmm. pretty in your face. But the group who were taking that stance um, were um, legal practitioners, law attorneys. And the, uh, the group um, was identified formally as mothers from hell because they were no longer prepared to accept that denigration and devaluing of their family members. Um, and they spoke collectively with a very, very powerful voice for change. And I think that um, disability arts can speak for a big audience, much bigger than perhaps people are prepared to want to recognize. Yes. What are we? It's, it's a, a quarter. Um, of the population pretty much identifying at some point of living with the impact, ongoing impact of impairment which causes disablement. I have it. I had a motorcycle accident as an 18 year old. Now I've got one leg quite a lot shorter than the other. 
spinal curvature, a replaced knee and shit, getting around on an uneven footpaths is a nightmare. Yeah. I'm with you on that. <laughs> so, so it's sort of a world and a space that we move in and out of, you know? Um, yeah. And, 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 and stand strong and crip identity. I think it's really, really important. And words matter. Good point, words and imagination are so powerful so kia ora. and speaking of words we've got a question in the chat which is uh thank you all i joined the zoom late so apologies if you explained i'm interested in the literal meaning of um how taurai as relates to pillar five and if there's time and the the term hotipua so rodney maybe you'd like to expand a little on those words on those meanings yeah kia ora, Z. Uh, Hotipo are extraordinary disabled people, and it comes from uh, uh, one of our daiti, Tafri Matia, who become blind, and the different honorings that occurred around the blindness of uh, Tafri Matia, hence Hotipo, extraordinary disabled people. And then we've got um, Hotorite or Manatorite, which is equity. So uh, that's just a real strong description of, of you know, or, uh, a sort of direct description, I should say, of those two Māori, those two Māori phrases. The kia ora. So, hey, can I just go back a step as well? Hey, Rod. Uh, Rod, do you mind just... Um, Doing a description of that art for us, please. Oh, okay. So what I held up was a was a um, a color. It's a book, and I, I masked the the front of the book. The book is actually about um, disability and sexuality and sexual participatory support in Scandinavia. Um, so there's the whole cover, and and so there are two objects that are that are photographed in color on the book, and they look like um, the vegetables, they, they look a little bit like parsnips, except they're not. They're, they're made of fiber wrapping. And so they're, they're quite tall in their scale. One would be 10 to 12 inches, one would be 14 inches or more. And the fiber wrapped shapes are in multiple colors and they're positioned on a black background, but the rest of the, 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 the visual is, is the book cover. Um, but Judith Scott's work was really the creation of um, objects that would look like the everyday. And uh -huh. she would, would create these objects by wrapping colored thread, colored twine, colored fiber um, around shapes made of paper or sticks, items that she gathered together and create these three dimensional sculptural objects um, and present those in such a way that over a period of more than a decade, she had a very, very powerful body of work that people could no longer ignore and had to acknowledge her um, as an insider arts practitioner and a very, very powerful art maker. And I think it, you know, pushes against the construct of, of what, is, what is good art. Um, this is amazing art, but it, but it, but it kind of requires the, the viewer to expand their mind somewhat more than they might routinely do which i think a lot of this Carrero is undergirding that that you know that the work is expansive in its impact upon people and their um, cultural reflection about disability difference and not seeing it as something that is a deficit laden and disease to be fixed and cured but rather i would much prefer that disability difference is something to be affirmed, valorized, and um, celebrated, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's the big, the big, the big plus on this is that this is actually an okay place and space to be in. Um, and yeah. Mm. Sorry, Suzanne, British poor laws have had a whole lot to do with the creation of the identity of a disabled person as a scrounger because they're not seen to work and contribute in a valid economic way. Mm. And oh, oh, shit, who, that's has dreadful, lot, eh? who has a lot to do with that? 
Oh, the British Poor Laws of um, 1604. Oh. Okay, set up charity at that point and decided who who was worthy or not worthy of the charitable response of other typical people who worked because they were the ones who didn't for a whole range of reasons. And yeah, and I'd also like to acknowledge that historically, or if we go back in sort of anthropology, um, in many indigenous cultures, a person with a disability was often a shaman and actually yeah. someone is actually having great spiritual um, uh, gifts for yes. the community. Um, yes. So we're also more empowered and yes. um, places for people with disabilities. And also disability sort of as a construct actually didn't really appear until the last sort of couple hundred years and sure. prior to that. Yeah. Yeah. People were only actually disabled if in, well, I guess when people lived in smaller communities, they were found a place, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. their, um, mm. whatever their embodiment, they kind of occupied a different, a certain space. Right. And so right. um, as long as they were part of the community, then actually they didn't have a disability. Yeah. Either that or they were knocked on the head. And I think yeah. that happened. Too. Yeah, so, too. Realistic. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, no, this <laughs> we don't, but, but yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and, um, and, the idea of disability is actually quite a, a, a recent thing, and it's also part of the sort of westernization um, concept of needing to classify things. Right. Um, and again, that's quite recent as well yeah. in our history, um, yeah. sort of a couple hundred years ago. Um, uh, science sort of appeared and, um, and this whole basis of that we need to classify everything in the world. Insects, you know, the land, people, we need to divide them all out and compartmentalise them so we can control them. Um, and actually, if you look at a lot of Indigenous cultures, um, they have a different very different perspective that actually things aren't separated out and there's a more holistic approach yeah, to yeah. ecology. Yeah, and, and can I come, come back on that? And, and, and absolutely. Um, and, and it was a very specific period of time, certainly in, in, in British society and science, um, in terms of the, the, the work of Charles Darwin and, and then the, the able to express ability in terms of um, a mathematical understanding, and that became something we called intelligence, because until um, Dalton, who was Darwin's cousin, and he was a statistician, until he came along, there was no measure of this. And, and in, in fact, if we go back and keep on the historical kind of line for a little while, go, go back to much earlier cultures, then people's ability to flourish was what was um, taken as valorizing and, and validating them, irrespective of whatever category was placed on them. Then to jump it right forward, then I'll shut up. Um, and, and Suzanne's pointing. So if we look at if we look at contemporary models of, of um, psychotherapy and intervention and working within Pacifica populations, then then in one of the dominant Pacifica populations in Aotearoa, um, hearing voices is not seen to be a bad thing. It's positive. It's a gift of a spiritual connection. Um, but in, um, you know, white colonial structures of, of the norm, that's seen to be an illness and a disorder that needs to be fixed and, and corrected. So um, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm all for not fixing and correcting, I'm afraid. You know, Thanks, Rob. We've got another question from the Facebook live chat. Um, steering it uh, a little back towards dance specifically, which is um, what's the conversation between mainstream art and kind of what's been uh, termed as, you know, art to the side in terms of disability consciousness? And it's followed by the question, why are there no disabled dancers in NZDC, in RNZB, in Black Grace, et cetera? And in the future, are we going to be looking towards more collaboration with these mainstream companies? Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Um, do you want to speak to that, Rodney, or shall I? And uh, you can lead it, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think actually there are changes overseas, not specifically in New Zealand. We're kind of behind the times, but in Europe, 
particularly. I'm not sure about the States. Um, there are dancers with disabilities who have professional careers and um, who do jobs for a wide range of companies, including mainstream companies. Um, so there's not many, but there are some, and there's a lot more independent um, performers, choreographers um, working in Europe. So there's just a bigger market for it there. So um, yeah, that, that sort of, I think um, the question is sort of about the disability ghetto, which is sometimes termed the disability ghetto. I think that um, there's pros and cons for it actually, because some disability artists make art for uh, the disability community and they're quite strong in their politics around that. It, um, about that's what their intention is. Um, and other artists, uh, they, uh, they, they're very clear that their art isn't specifically about disability at all. They just happen to have a disability and they're making art. Um, so there's kind of um, a wide range out there, but um, getting back to, yeah, we haven't seen a lot of movement. You know, for example, we still have Touch Compass, you know, which um, started off as an integrated dance company and it's only recent, very recently become disability led. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's sort of separated out as a specific company that actually does create a platform for artists with disabilities and they're for, you know, at this stage, we're the only really professional company that does that in New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, progress is slow on that front. Can we have an interpreter change, please? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, kia ora, Suzanne. I absolutely echo that sentiment. I mean, one, one of the great social indictments of the professional performance world is that when a disabled artist is involved in what you would refer to as quote unquote mainstream art it becomes a news story right like just a few years ago when the Royal Shakespeare Company um, made a huge song and dance and a lot of pre-promotion about the fact that they'd employed three actors in um, a series of As You Like It and Someone Else Dream and it was a huge story over in over in the UK um, why? Because there were three artists with disabilities who were involved in mainstream art. Why is that news? And I guess that's kind of what, what we're looking for in the future, isn't it? To, to, to normalise all of this and just be recognised as all our touch compass artists and performers and dancers and theatre practitioners and installation artists are all recognised as being superb performers. The, the, the. Right? Not just not just that they are artists with a disability, they are exceptional artists who have a, dis, a disability. So it, it, you're absolutely right that they're just that dial hasn't been moved. And, and I guess in many ways that's kind of the challenge that we we're sitting about with our strategic vision. Um, on that, I, I just really tell this um, this panel. So I'll, just to share with you, we've been going through a strategic plan, strategic visioning stage right now that we're in the middle of. And um, because we are a, a disability-led arts organisation, the concept was we actually led from what's the strategy behind disability-led and arts before we stepped it through to what does that look like for our organisation. So we've taken a very different approach to the strategy planning and I absolutely um, have nothing but, but aroha and, and huge um, thanks to this artistic panel for really putting in the, the hard yards on the thinking on the on the Focado. And as you've seen today, the words that sit behind those pillars of disability consciousness. And I think between that and our alignment to the principles around Te Tiriti or Waitangi, uh, partnership, participation and protection um, of our disabled artists, our Hotipo, our extraordinary disabled artists, I think we're in a really strong position to be a true Aotearoa leader. And that's, uh, that really is huge credit to the, to the three that you've heard from today. Anyway, enough from me. You'll hear more about the 2022 program going forward. And of course, the um, strategic plan that we'll be releasing shortly, uh, all in due course, but let's not take the wind out of the sails yet. Uh, I'll throw it back to this outstanding panel, who I have nothing but massive love and respect for. Kia ora. Kia ora, John. Now, we have any other questions? I see in the chat there, Trish, 
you ask, you know, we're going to be taking on new artists. I think our door, well, you know, we anticipate setting up the structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Community that we have now within Touch Compass Dance Trust. And I must Sorry, admit, Rodney, you might need to go back a bit. You just froze out there. Mm. Oh, okay, sorry, am I back? It wasn't a dance. <laughs> but yeah, I was just expressing that uh, we definitely, as part of uh, the structure we're trying to set up moving forward as an ADP, is to have that space where we can welcome uh, disabled artists or, or uh, disabled people in that are thriving to be artists. And, and I, I do admit though that it, um, like uh, to dance takes for myself, takes real big commitment. And I just sense that, you know, um, there's, lots, there's lots and lots of supports and, and sort of perspectives that need to be uh, looked at and, and quantified in relationship to supporting someone who wants to be an artist. And yeah, but for me as an artist, I, I you know, it's not, I wouldn't call it sacrifice, but I've been driven by passion first and foremost, but also the, the commitment and the drive that I've had to, had to like dig deep to find at times, you know, and, you know, like all dancers, the aches and pains, <laughs> and setting up, um, you know, a really strong recovery system as well. And, you know, being healthy as well, trying to be as healthy as possible, eat, sleep, and so forth. And then the if who so the story on energy, I think that was well done for my uh, uh, performance. I really enjoyed your story, Lucy. Uh, at the end, as from myself, at the end, and that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it was much the way. For everyone unfamiliar, Lucy was featured on Altitude television program last week, and you can uh, find uh, it on uh, TVNZ On Demand. And it's uh, um, a short documentary about, uh, sorry, Attitude, not Altitude. Um, it's a, my mistake. It's a, um, a short documentary on Lucy's process to build her show Topo, which uh, premiered at Cuba Dupa in 2019, 2020. 2020, yes. <laughs> 19. Yes, yeah. It was this year. Yeah. I don't know what year it is this year. So 2021 was when it premiered. Oh. Thank your pardon, everyone. <laughs> okay, thanks. Here, here, oh. is, here is the link if you missed it. Oh. Thanks for doing that. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Is there any other burning yeah. you know, yeah. questions out there? Well, look, Rodney, just just adding, you see, we've got Duncan sitting over there, and I think yeah. he's an example of preparation and commitment and a support network and engagement from someone who is at, at, at the other end of the fish, yeah, down in, in Wellington, and, and yet works in a, in a vital way. But to acknowledge that, that his processes and his achievements are actually supported by a very tight fire network around him, making that possible. So, um, you know, and Duncan is one of many of the younger participants in the field of um, performance arts and theatre and disability who do have um, ongoing engagement and commitment. Only some come through, um, but certainly, you know, um, and in touch compass with the youth and community class, there are people who have been really tied in there. And Lucy would, you know, she's going, yeah, absolutely. Um, thinking about the people in that group, and they do, they put the mahi in. So um, yet it may not be that they seek it for performance outcomes for themselves, 
but the other things that um, a companionship, a friendship, and a solidarity yeah. is generated by this mutual activity. It's very, very powerful. Mm. And um, I think, you know, that's a, a, an added strength that undergirds yeah. this, this direction forward. It mm -hmm. brings people through. We don't see all of them, you're absolutely right, at that kind of peak level. Um, but but there is a sort of a, a, a core, and there has been for quite a long time. So, um, you know, big ups for them, big ups for Duncan, and his mum and dad who put a lot of hard work in. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I says something too like we, if we look at why aren't disabled people in all these different companies i think we've got to remember those companies are directed by certain choreograph or, or an artistic approach True. And, yeah and so you know maybe uh and it's all sort of developed from initiated from stories as well so i think um when you when we, we're saying why aren't we seeing that are uh, these disabled people in these companies i think the stories that underpin the choreography or the, you know, the... Yeah, the but what I'm saying... Choreography has to include that sort yeah, what, of space. What, what you can just say is, is the truth of just being left. Because just being left, being, being just being left, they, they have a right to be teachers, they have a right to be directors, they have a right to be a cho cho choreographer. That's, that, that's just being left. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. stories. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in the, I think, in, the, in the network as well. Yeah. I think one of the issues that's sort of been coming up out of the conversation is that there's a very limited number of narratives around the story of disability. Um, and, you know, sort of spoke to that with the different models of disability. But, you know, disability, yeah seems to be a very limited story at the moment. There's only a few ways in society that we're telling that story. And so I guess the opportunity is for us to develop new narratives for what the experience of disability is and to expand that. And I think also we can um, look to um, the LGTQ, sorry, I just get that wrong, um, community for that um, LGBTQT community but that as well, the queer community yeah. are extending um, yeah. narratives around different ways of being um, in society and that there are different ways of living and, and uh, yeah, sort of getting away from um, quite sort of tight um, perceptions of what it is to be normal. Yeah, but normal is actually... If you're a, a non-disabled non -disabled dancer, they won't, what they want to do is to c c control dis disability artists. That's not right. We want to be together. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you all so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your time. And like, as he said, just reach out if you'd like to get in touch with us. Very excited about the space. And like I said, it's a tethering space right now, but we are feeling really committed to um, shifting towards this disability consciousness and also shifting in a way that's more around the collective consciousness as well, underpinning that. So Noreda, Tene to me here, Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.